And the first thing we do in chapter two is we get away from how to collect the data. This is the ways we collect the data. And we move on into how to organize it and eventually how to summarize it. So we're going to talk about what's called a frequency distribution right now. Are there any questions before we get going on this? I asked you to look at this classroom and to count the number of brown-haired people and the number of black-haired people and the number of blonde-haired people and put it in a list, this is probably how you'd do it. You'd probably do blonde, brown, black, and count them up and put them right here. 7, 15, 12. You'd probably do something like that, wouldn't you? This is one of the simplest versions of a frequency distribution that I can think of. This is a frequency distribution. We're going to make it a little more specific for our, our reasoning, but this is the idea. You have what are called classes, just groups, and you have counts, frequencies. A frequency is how often something occurs. Seven blonde people, that, blonde people occurred seven times. Brown-haired people, 15 times. So these are our classes, and these are our frequencies. This is a frequency distribution. We're going to talk about that right now. You know, I think the way that I'd like to do this with you is we'll actually create a frequency distribution right now. And as we do it, I'll be giving you the definitions and things like that and show you how. So the first thing you need to know about frequency distributions is there's something called a class width. I need to define that before we actually start making this up. So frequency distributions, what we have is a list of values. These are our values, our classes and the corresponding frequencies. The list of values with corresponding frequencies. With. What we're going to be doing is creating frequency distributions that are based on numbers. In a, in a second, what I'm going to do in this class is I'm going to make a frequency distribution based on our ages. Um, so we can kind of have the idea of how you make, make all these things up. So first thing, the class width. This is going to be the difference between two lower class limits. I haven't even defined that yet, but I'm going to. This is the difference between two lower class limits. Lower class limit, classes is not like this class, it's like the group, like the group of, of data that you're going to try to collect from. Like in here, do we have anyone under 18 in here? Okay, so 18 is going to be our starting point. Under here, in this class, our first group is probably going to be 18 to 20 year olds. And that'll be our first group, or 18 to 21 year olds. That'll be our first class. The class is just the first group, or the second group, or the third group. Those are all classes. The lower class limit is where the class starts. So if I have a group of 18 to 21 year olds, 18 would be my lower class limit. Does that make sense to you? That's where the class starts.
So we'll say here, uh, the smallest number belonging to a class. Well, that, there is an upper class limit also, and that's going to be well, clearly the, the highest value belonging to the class. So upper class limit, this last thing before we do, before we get into this upper. Upper class limit. Okay, I'd like to give you your steps right here on how to do this. The first thing that you need to do when you're creating your own frequency distribution like I'm about to do is determine the number of classes. This means like those groups we were just talking about. You see, you don't want to have too few groups that you can't differentiate between them, or too many groups that it, it's just too, too cumbersome and you can't tell trends. So in, in this class, I'm going to separate us, just looking around, I'm thinking I'm going to want eight classes here. So I'm going to have eight classes. So for us, in this one example, I'm going to make eight. I think that Two, more than that would, would not show trends, and I think less than that, like, do, do you ever want to have a frequency distribution with one class, do you think? With one class. Everybody would be in that class. Would that show you anything? Not so much. Would you want a class for every single person? <laughs> you, you wouldn't see any trends. You wouldn't see that. So here we have, we have a certain number of classes that you're going to determine by looking at your population that you're sampling. Okay, the second thing you got to do is you have to figure out your class width. This is the important part. Here's how you, in general, find a class width. What you do is you take your highest value in your, popula in your, your sample and you take your lowest value in your sample, and you find the difference, so that, that range, and then you divide that by the number of classes. So I'm going to say here the max value, subtract the min value, this is for your sample, and then you're going to divide by the number of classes. Okay, we're going to do that in here. Hopefully no one's worried too much about their age. Uh, are there any 17-year-olds in here? 16? 15? Okay, good. 18? 18, okay, good. Uh, do we have anyone over... Well, I know I am. How about over... 50? 45? 40? 40, do you mind? Yeah, 44. 44. Okay. So 44 is our max value. <coughs> Minus 18 is our minimum value. And we're going to divide by the number of classes. How many classes did I pick here? Eight. Okay, we're going to divide by 8. So we do that. Uh, someone with a calculator out there, what is 44 minus 18? How much should we get? Or without a calculator, just do it. <laughs> Don't everyone talk at once. Let's go here, people. <laughs> How much? 
26, you said? I believe you. Divided by 8. Well, wait a second, Mr. Leonard. 8 doesn't go into 26 evenly. No, chances are this is probably not going to be even. In fact, we get, let's see, uh, 3.25? Yeah. Yeah, 3.25. Yeah, that's right. Your class width has to be a whole number. So here's what you're going to do. No matter what the decimal is, if you have a decimal, you are going to round upwards. If you round downwards, you're not going to have enough, enough room for everybody in your sample. You're, you'll have eight classes, but it'll stop too short, and you'll have to make another class. If you want eight classes, you need to round up. That'll cover everybody. Do you, do you see why? You can't round up. You've got to round up. I know even though it's 3.2, you go, well, that rounds to three. Well, yeah, in like algebra stuff it does, but in statistics, when we need a certain number of classes, we're going to round that up. It's going to go to four. So we, we are going to round up. So this is going to become 4. Our class width is going to be 4 for our example. So we're about ready to start making this thing. Here's how a typical frequency distribution looks. We're going to have what we're looking at. In our case, it's age. Here, and we're going to list the frequencies here. So we determine the number of classes. I determine that. In your book, it'll tell you what to use. Or on your test, it'll tell you use eight classes or use six classes. So it will tell you that. But you do need to know how to do this stuff. You'll take the max value minus the min value. That gives you a range for your sample. You divide that by the number of classes. You round it up, and that tells you your class width. Here's how you find your class width. You must have a starting point. This is uh, step three. And typically, we're going to start with the minimum value. That seems obvious. That'll include everybody. Or you could, if, if, if you want to do this, you can start with a value just below your minimum value. So I could start with 17 if I wanted to. But typically, you start with your lowest value. And so in our case, we had 18. So over here, we finally get to start filling this thing out. I'm going to put 18 right here. The next step is the most important step, because everyone can count. We can all count frequencies, but making up the classes, that's the hard part, where people get messed up. So pay close attention. If you, quite don't get, if you don't quite get it, go back on this lecture online and watch it again until you get this down. What you're going to do is, after you start with the smallest value, you're going to create the classes using the class width. Here's the key. The class width is not the difference between 18 to this number. This would be the upper class limit. The class width is the difference between this number and this number. So we're not going to do this. We're not going to go 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. We're not going to do that. Mm -mm. We're going to do 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 goes here. Why? Because this distinguishes classes. And if you have classes which are four years apart, think about it. 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, and 21-year-olds, four years, are going to fit in this class. Do you see that? I can't include 22 here. That would be a class with a five. It would include the 22-year-olds. Do you see the point there? That would actually be a class with a five. So be careful. This is where people make a mistake on the test. They go 22, and then they're off a sequential year for every class. And then and they go, wait a minute, I have way too many classes. This has zero. Well, that's because you did wrong. Okay. So this is the way we do this. We go four here, and then we, we're going to create eight classes from here on out. So 18 to 22. 22 to what? 22. Hopefully 20. Remember, our class with is four. 
and then again to, and then, how many classes do we need? Perfect. And then what? And then what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know what? That's going to work out perfect for us because we have 44 in our group, right? Look at our last class is going to include. Uh, Why are we too many? Uh, I guess that could happen since you round up. We might have an extra class in there, uh, which we do. We're going to have zero, 46 through 47, 49. So we do this, then we create our classes going this way. So we're just going to go to one less than our next, next uh, lower class limit. So this is going to be our 21, our 25, our 29, 33, 37, 41, 45, and then lastly we're going to have 49. But that's the way we do this. We create lower, we create all the lower class limits first. And finally, we're just going to tally up the results. We're going to start on this next time. You have all the information to make these now, but I, I really do want to go through this and do this again and count up all the people and make sure that we have that down. How many people understood what we talked about today? Okay. Again, why we might have an extra class is because you round, you do round up. Um, that's necessary to include everybody, but I guess you can do an extra class. With them. You do have some homework? No, 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 not. Oh, it's oh, it's just reverse it. It sounds a lot better. <laughs> That's what makes it sound. Just because I want it to. Okay, uh, you're going to do, by the way, this is also on the website, which I gave you over there. Uh, go ahead and look at the, please go on that. That way you get more views and feel cooler. Can you do that for me? <laughs> just kidding. Uh, go to section 1.5 and do page 34 to 35. Numbers are 1, 2, 5 through 25. That assignment's also on the website. If you go under and look at your class homework assignments, that'll be there as well. All right, guys, that'll be due on Monday. Have a great day. I'll see you on Monday. Okay, so if you do remember, last time we were going through our frequency distributions, and I have given you definitions for this. Can you remember what our class width was from last time? Four. All right. And the way we figured out our class width from last time is we took the maximum value for our sample minus the minimum value for our sample. We divided by the number of classes we wanted, and then we rounded up. As we found from last time, this is an approximate way to get your classes, but you're never going to be too low. You're, you're going to have a class for every person at least. Maybe, I think we have one extra actually. We're going to have zero one, but that's okay. So our class width in our case was four. The lower class limit, that was the smallest value in each class. So we're going to list those out in just a second. And the upper class limit is the largest value in each class. The class midpoint, we'll get to those after we fill out our, our chart over there, our frequency distribution. Now the question I have for you is this. As far as the class width goes, does the class width measure four units this way from lower to upper, or does it measure this way from lower to lower? So we're not going to go 18 to 22 this way. We're going to go 18 to 22 this way. And I gave you the reason why last time we want four years spaced here, not five. If you go to 22 here, there's five years between the lowers. And we want only four. That's why our class width is four. So we will make this 22. The next one I think I gave you, of course, we'll be going up by four. So what's the next one? 26. And then? 30. Then? 34. Mm -hmm. 30. Perfect. 42. And? 46. Okay, and I made the other ones up, the next part up, very quickly last time. But what you're doing is you're just going to one step below your next lower class limit. So from 18 to 22, we need the number what right here? We don't want 22. Because 22, then you would count 22 year olds in two different classes. That's not a good thing. So we're going to go to 21, you're right. And then you can count up by four for all of these limits also. So for 21, this one's going to be, and it should be one less than our next lower class limit. Okay. Uh, do you feel okay on getting the classes made up? So we get the maximum uh, level for our sample minus the minimum value. 
we divide by the number of classes we want. We start at some starting spot, either the lowest value of our sample or something just below that. We make up our classes by using the class width in conjunction with that starting spot. Make up all your lower class limits first, then we fill the upper class limits in. A couple of things before we actually do the frequency. The class midpoints. The midpoint is just the middle value of those classes. It's, it's nothing tricky to find this. You're just going to average the upper and lower class limits. We haven't talked about average, but we're talking about the, the average that you all know as average, where you add two things together and you divide by two. That's our, our average. So when we find the middle, the, the class midpoint, we're talking about the, the value right in between the middle of our class. So we're going to take the upper class limit. minus the lower class limit, I'm sorry, plus the lower class limit, and we'll divide that by two. And that'll give us the midpoint for each class. Which one haven't I got? The boundaries? The class boundaries are really only used, to, these two are really only used to make up a histogram, which we're going to talk about in just a little while. Class boundaries <clears throat> are the very middle between one upper class limit and the next lower class limit. So we're going to discover these in just a second, but that's our definition. So in order to find a class boundary, what you're going to take is an upper, the lower class limit, Minus the upper class limit, or plus the upper class limit, and geez, I'm saying everything wrong today, huh? My goodness. <laughs> we'll re rephrase that for you. We're just going to average these ones as well. So the midpoint is the average of these two, the lower and the upper for the same class. The boundary is the average of these two, right in between the, the two classes. So for us, we'll say that the boundary is used to separate classes without gaps, because we can't have gaps on a histogram. You'll see what I'm talking about in just a minute. For the class width, um, are we giving it to us, or we have to come up with our own? Well, you see, your class width is determined by your maximum value, minus your minimum value, and the number of classes that, that you need. So if I tell you five classes with a certain number. So the number of the classes that we need, we're going to be given that? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I'll give you that. I, for this one, I just made up, I want eight classes. All right. So for you guys, I'll, it'll be like in your homework, or I'll give it to you on a test, okay? On a test, I would give you like a list of data, like, I don't know, 20 pieces of data. I'd say I want you to make up a histogram or a frequency distribution, which comes from it. Uh, I'm sorry, histogram comes from the frequency distribution. So I'd give you the data. I'd say I want six classes. Figure it out. You take the maximum value, minus the minimum value, divide by six, round up. That gives you your class width. Does that make sense to you? If you forgot how to do that, remember, go online. You can refresh that all you want. Um, the whole lesson's on there already. So. OK, the, great question. Any other questions about any of these things so far? We're going to go through in a minute and identify all of our lower class limits, upper class limits, and all this stuff as well. So class boundaries, last thing we have to define. This is used to separate our classes without gaps. You see on a histogram, it's like a touching bar chart. We can't have any gaps in there. Okay, so let's go through and let's identify what all these numbers are because I've given you the definitions, but we really haven't even discussed what they, they actually are for this example. Can you tell me the first lower class limit that we have? Very good. Okay, what's the next lower class limit that we have? Good. How many lower class limits should we have? Because there are eight classes. That's right. So 22, and then we go on up to 26. Etc. We should have eight of them. It goes all the way to 46. How about the upper class limits? What are the upper class limits here? The one's the first one, and then? Mm -hmm. And again, we're getting all the way up to 49. There should be eight of them. The class midpoints. That's the average of the upper and lower class limits for each class. Can you tell me what is the class midpoint for our very first class? How much is that? Do it on your paper if you have to. 
you're taking the upper plus the lower divided by two, you're averaging that. Nice glasses, by the way. I like them. Thank you. I kind of like That's why I like them. I got new ones. New glasses. They look identical. Yeah, so, the same yeah. example. See, I can't, I'm a creature of habit. You can't really change if your things are going well, which I hope that these are going well. You can't change it. <laughs> Did you figure it out as I was rambling? Use your calculator if you have to. You're averaging, averaging a couple numbers. What numbers are we adding together up here for our first class midpoint? Can you tell me that? Great, so we're, we're going to have a class midpoint for every single class. So we look here, we go, okay, that's my upper class limit, that's my lower. Let's add them together, let's divide by two. That tells me what's right in the middle of those two numbers, and what number is that? I'm sorry, I heard rustling and mumbling. What was it? 19.5? Okay, I believe. Did anybody else get 19.5? Do you know how 19.5 is being found? Some people know. Okay. If you're not quite sure how you're finding the class midpoint, watch. How the class midpoint is found for each class, you're taking the upper, CL stands for class limit. In our case, the upper class limit for our very first class is 21. So we are taking 21, we are adding to it, what are we adding to it? Oh, that's the lower class limit, that's this right here. You're adding 18, and then you're dividing by 2. Why are you dividing by 2? Why are you dividing by 2? So how you find an average of two things is you or average of any number of things, you add them all together and you divide by the number of things you added. So here we have two classes, you're adding them, you're dividing by the number two, and then this number, this value is going to give you 19.5. You with me now? What's the next midpoint? Can you find that? I'll give you a little hint. Well firstly, you understand you can add these two together and divide by two, right? Mm -hmm. Nod your head if you're with me on that. That's how you find that class midpoint. Or you can be a little smarter than that. What's our class width? Just add four to that number. You're going to come with the class midpoint. Okay. This is kind of neat. All these numbers are multiples of, well, you add four to that. They're not multiples of four, but you keep adding four to it. Here you keep adding four to it. Therefore, the midpoint, you're going to keep adding four to it. You don't have to repeat all that work. You don't reinvent the wheel. Just add four to it. So someone who has added these two and divided by two, tell me what you got. And t guess what? If I add four to this number, I get 23.5. So I'm going to find out midpoints right there. Are you with me? Can you tell me just very quickly what's the next midpoint without doing any math? That's kind of nice. How about the next midpoint? 31.5. Someone on the right-hand side of the room, how about the next midpoint? My right. Righties. Next midpoint. Perfect. How many midpoints are we going to have? Well, 39.5. We'll have 40. What's the next one? And lastly, we'll have 47.5. And those are the values that are right in between each class. Raise your hand if you're okay on the lower class limits, upper class limits, and the class midpoints. Feel okay about that? Good. Very good. Remember, you don't have to do the work for every one of these. You just have to know the first one and, and know your class width. If you know your class width, it becomes very, very easy here. So we should have eight lower class limits, eight upper class limits, eight class midpoints. Let's talk about class boundaries, and then we're going to fill this thing out. It's going to look beautiful. I'll tell you what else we can do with this. The class boundaries are used to separate your classes without gaps. Here's how you do it. What you do is, and by the way, I know it, it's a little confusing where, what class boundaries actually do but they're not used in any computation. They're literally for one thing and one thing only. What you're going to do is be able to make a histogram up with this information. That's it. It doesn't tell you where things go, like where you're going to tally up numbers. That's, that's what your classes do. Uh, the class boundaries really are just to separate classes so you don't see any gaps. Are you with me on this? OK. So class boundaries, they're the value that's right in between your upper class limit for one class 
and the sequential lower class limit for the next class. You can average them. Add them, just like you did the class midpoints, and divide by 2. Or you can just kind of think about that. What's right in between 21 and 22? Right? Say it louder. 21.5? Yeah. It's 21.5. Do you know what you're going to get if you add 21 and 22 and divide by 2? You get 21.5. <clears throat> Someone in the middle of the room here, can you tell me the next class boundary? Can you tell me that? Is it louder? Yeah. You can still use that class width thing, by the way, or you can do the math if you really, really, really want to. But you can average these two, or just add four, or just think about it, 25, 26, what's right in the middle, 25.5. Next ones, we can find all of them if we'd like. We can have 29.5, I hope. Is that right? Yes. All right. What's the next one? Should we have? 49.5. Does 49.5 make sense to you how we get that? There's not another class, but you see that we're, we're just going up by four every time. Now, I know there's eight here, and there's eight here, and there's eight here, and right now we have eight here, but there's actually one more. There's actually one more. Notice that these class boundaries are really like slicing up a loaf of bread. Okay, so we have this, this loaf of bread that goes from Eight, uh, just before, well, 18 to 49, and we're slicing it up here and here and here and here and here and here and here. If you have a loaf of bread and you slice it, you're going to get one more piece of bread for however many slices you make. Does that make sense? You get a loaf of bread, you slice it once, you have two slices. True? Slice it three times, you're going to have four slices. We've sliced it using these classes, but that means that we're going to have this little extra one to begin with, because we have to start somewhere. So can you tell me what the very first class boundary is going to be? Yeah, that's right. Notice how in this case, the class boundaries, they really don't make a whole lot of sense for 17.5, do they? Well, if you consider to have 0.5 of a year, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It makes sense in this case, though. If we are considering these numbers to be your age without decimals, because, I mean, if you're over the age of, like, I don't know, seven, you stop saying, I'm like six and three quarters, you know, don't you? I don't say that I am blank age point three. <laughs> Obviously, I say I'm blank age. Uh, but, but you say I am 22. Are you 22? Yeah. Are you seriously? Yeah. I should work at a fair. <laughs> uh, so if you say I'm 22, you don't go I'm 22.4 or 22.6. If we're just counting the, the integer of our age or the whole number of our age, then 17.5 works, right? Because you're either 17 or 18. You're not going to count any extra people with 17.5 is what I'm saying. The 17 year olds are excluded automatically. Are you with me on that? So it's, it's kind of a, a weird thing to say, but it's used really just to separate some classes from each other. That's it. It's not mathematically being used in any way up here. So we do have a first one. We're going to have one more class boundary than we have classes because we have to start somewhere and we have to end somewhere. Okie dokie. Now, let's go ahead and fill this thing out some more. We've already made our classes using our class width and our lower class limits and our starting spot and a range of numbers being subtracted, divided by the number of classes that we want. That's how we got all this junk. Now we're going to fill it out by asking people how old they are. So how many people are between the ages of 18 and 21? Raise your hand. 18 to 21. Keep them up because i got to count you. Okay, so we have 25. How about 22 to 25? Awesome. How about 26 to 29? Thirty-four to 
42 to 45. And 46 to 49, I don't think we have anybody. Can you add yourself on that? <laughs> Count the number of people. Count that all up and we'll see. 32? Uh, I'm like 23. I'm just really... <laughs> would it actually be better if I was like 80 and just never aged? Would that be sweet? That'd be better. <laughs> it's immortal, people. I mean, uh, we can do yourself in 30, 33. Yeah, I did. But I could be lying. But no to do that. <laughs> Kind of myself in 18 to 21 year olds too. So <laughs> anyway, um, so we have all these frequencies for each class. We have it so you know just by looking at it where the majority of people are, right? Because this, is, I mean, typically this is what's going to happen in most of your classes. We're going to have people scattered, but they're going to generally be right here, and we'll have some people over here. But most people are, are going to be here. And that's what frequency distributions can show: is trends and patterns. If we just had everyone's age down on a piece of paper it'd be hard to kind of see a lot of trends and patterns, especially if there's lots and lots of data. Here we only have maybe 40-something 40 40 something pieces of data. You start having like 1,000 pieces of data, then you start seeing trends when you do this, but not if you just have them listed out. It's really hard to see. So this is one way that we can organize our data. Are you okay on getting your frequency distribution? Okay. What do we do with this stuff? Well, one thing that we can do, we're, I'm going to show you some extensions of this concept. One thing we can do is create what's called a relative frequency distribution from this thing. Are there any questions on this? This stuff first. So a relative frequency distribution. We're going to add some, uh, some columns here. say this is going to be relative frequency. Relative frequency distribution. Here's how this one works. What it does, it compares the frequency for each class to the total number of data items you collected. So that's how relative frequency works. This one just gives you the number of people. Relative frequency is going to give you, write this down please, a percentage. This is going to be a percentage. It's going to compare the class frequency to the total number of, your, of items in your sample. How could we find right now the total number of items that we have just collected? Without having me count every person in this room, because that's really boring. Yeah, if, you can, if every person had a spot, which we made sure of, right? Every person has a spot because that's how we created our frequency distribution to make sure that, that would happen. So if every person has a spot, if you add all these up, it's going to give you a total count for your sample. Okie dokie? Okay on that one? I said that twice today already. Old school. Bring back the okie dokie. So add them all up. If we add them, we get the 25 plus 10 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1. How much is that? I got 43. We're going to use a, a letter for that. That's a lowercase n. It's 43. That's how many items we collected. You can also signify it this way. Have you ever seen this symbol before? It's like a Greek letter, sigma, and sum. It means you're adding up all the frequencies. That also is the same thing some of the frequencies, or n in some cases it's called. So we want to relate the class count to our n, or to the sum of our frequencies. We're going to create a percentage, and here's how you do it. If you want to find the percent 
of the people who are in this bracket, you're going to take the number, your frequency, and divide it by the total class count, or the total n, sum of frequencies. So class frequency divided by the sum of the frequencies. Can someone out there with a calculator, you should all have a calculator at this point. Someone out there with a calculator, can you do the 25 divided by 43 and tell me what you get to the third decimal place? 0.581. Like that? Did anyone else get 0.581? Yeah. Did you all get 0.581? Yeah. I hope you have a calculator to follow along because part of this class is calculator. I mean, you are going to be using one like every day. So bring a calculator. So 0.58, what's 0.581 mean? Five eight one. It sounds like a whole number rolls off your tongue. But what's it mean? Fifty eight percent of the people are in that that class right there. The eighteen through twenty one. Perfect. How'd you get fifty eight percent? We can change proportions, which is like a decimal, into a percentage just by moving in two spots, right? Mm -hmm. So if I say point five eight one, maybe for your boss you don't say point five eight one because he might have done what I asked what you did when I asked you to go. So maybe we go, okay, instead of 0 0.581, we could write this as 58.1, but you better put a percent if you're going to do that. Either way is fine with me, I really don't care. You just need to know that when we say 0 0.581, what we're suggesting here is that 58.1% of our sample was between the ages of 18 and 21. That's what we said. Does that seem reasonable for our class? Sure, yeah, most people, 58, most is above 50% for you, just so you know. If anything ever says most, it means above 50%. Most people are, are between 18 and 20, 21. No problem, 58%. Let's do the rest of them on your own. Take out your calculator, figure out the percentages for the rest of our classes. Guys, if I'm walking around and you don't know what you're doing, now is the time to ask me when I'm here to help you right now. So if you're like a little lost, Okay, let's get back up here. If you're struggling a little bit on finding this, what we're doing for each individual class, you're taking the frequency divided by your total count. That's your n or your sum of frequencies, which is pointing to the 43. So for this one, we did 25 divided by 43. Now that did give us 0.581. We're just changing that to a percentage because most people are better with percentages. You don't have to if you don't want to. I really don't care. For the next one, we're going to take what number? Divided by what? What's 10 divided by 43? 23. 23 point, 23 point what? You have to round correctly in here. So learn your rounding rules. You look at the decimal place past where you're trying to round. So if I said three decimal places, 
I think on, on your calculator it would have been uh, 0 0.232556. Yes? No. Yeah. What is it? 23, 25, 48. 58, okay. Well, that's pretty close. Come on now. <laughs> so we're trying to round here, right? We look just at the digit to the right. Not all this crap. We don't care about that. Just at this digit. If that's five or more, you better round this one up. If this is less than five, you leave this one alone. And then you stop your, your, your number. So in our case, we are 0.233. If you round incorrectly in this class, it's going to kill you. And the reason is, is because we deal with very small numbers and very precise numbers a lot of the times. We'll be at the fourth, fifth, sometimes even sixth decimal place when we're working with equations. If you round incorrectly on just a little portion of it and we use that number over again, then we use that number over again, and we use that number over again, do you see how your error is going to be multiplied? Do you see that? It's like an exponential error after that. That's not a good thing. You're going to be way off. And in this class, it's a really uh, precise class. So here, we need to learn how to round. If, if you don't really know, you're not quite sure, come and see me. I'll help you out with that. So in our case, we had, I'll, I'll make, make it also a percentage. So we rounded to 0 0.233. We'll make it 23.3%. How many we got 23.3%? Good, all right. Now, you've already done the rest of it, I'm sure. So what's our 4 divided by 43? 9 point what now? 3 0. 3 0? 9 point what? 3 0. 3 0. Okay. Oh, good point. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> Do you want to put that in the other side? Nope. Right. I just messed it up. How about the 2? 4 4 I can't hear you. 4 4 4 4 4 4 Which one? 7 Okay. How about 4 the 1? 2.3. How about for the zero? Zero. Good. I think I can figure that one out again. And zero. By the way, how much should this add up to? Uh, better, right? If you add that and it comes out like 95% or like 120%, you probably made a mistake somewhere. So that's a way to, that you can check your work. Your relative frequency should add to 100%. That's what it should do. If it doesn't, you got an error somewhere. Now, because we're rounding, could you technically be over or under a little teeny bit? Yeah, you could because you're rounding, but it's not going to be much. It's not going to be like over a percent. So if it is, then you, you have an error there. How many people are with me so far in relative frequency? Good. So relative means as compared to the whole. That's what relative means. How it's much, a percentage. How much over or under would it be a little wrong? Probably not over a percent. Could go point three. Um, if we were over like three percent, if it was like one hundred three percent, there'd be something wrong. Either that, or you have a lot of classes. That could, that, I guess that could happen. Yeah, around. Okay, so let's move on from relative frequency distributions. There's one other one we have to talk about before our histograms and some of our graphing here. It's called a cumulative frequency distribution. You ever heard that word cumulative? You, you have a, something that's cumulative, right? Your GPA. Uh, you have the GPA. Cumulative GPA is not just for a semester, is it? It's for what? Everything. Whole college experience. Yeah, that's exactly right. So cumulative means you're kind of adding to it as you go, right? You take a semester, that's your GPA. That's also your cumulative. But the next semester you take, not only do you have a GPA for that individual semester, you combine it with the first one. Are you, are you following me along? Because I'm going to make I'm going to draw an analogy here. After you take another semester, it's not just that one, but it's this one combined with the other two. And one after that is combined with the other three. You just keep on combining them and combining them. That's how a cumulative frequency distribution works as well. It just keeps on adding to it class by class. So cumulative frequency distribution. This keeps on adding as you go, class by class. And I'll say it adds sequential classes together. The 
let's try this for a second. So we have, uh, we have our very first class. How many people in our very first class? Okay, so if we're going to make a cumulative frequency distribution, what you keep asking yourself is, how many people do you have right now, including all the previous classes? So after our first class, check it out. After our first class, how many people do we have total after this, right at this class? Now, we're going to go down to the next class. How many people do we have total after this class? Remember, it's cumulative, so it includes the first class. Well, how would you get to 35? Great, so we're just adding up everything before. That's what makes it cumulative. As you keep going down, you just add everything up above it. So this is going to be 35. That's how many people are this class or above. How many people are going to be after our third class over here? So you're not adding these two, are you? You're adding the, this column, your frequencies. Cumulative frequency means you're adding the frequency as you go. So here we had only 25 people. Here we have 35 people. Here we have how many again? How about after this one? How about after this one? This one? Guess what? Is this a coincidence? Are these the same? Pretty good. We added up all the people. In a different way, we add it to all the people, right? When you get down to the end, these should be exactly the same number. If they're not, well, you have a mistake there. Cumulative frequency will end at the total number that you collected. But that's it. That's where we're end. Do you feel okay with all of our class width, lower class limit, upper class limit, class midpoint, class boundaries, making up our frequency distribution, and now with relative and cumulative frequency? Now, raise your hand and feel okay with that. That's good. That's great. You'll get some practice tonight when you go home and do some of that homework. Yeah. By the way, you're going to go home and do some of that homework. <laughs> All right. What's well, Monday without homework, right? Right? Amazing. I know, right? It's actually a decent Monday. Okay. We are, in a second, going to make this more graphical because a lot of people have trouble just looking at numbers and understanding really what we're trying to get them to grasp. So especially in, in real life, we like to use graphs, uh, pie charts or, or histograms, bar charts, things like that to make our data more visible. Because people can look at a graph and go, oh, I see. But when you look at the number, a lot of people aren't going to really grasp that concept. You know what I'm saying? So we're gonna, I'm going to show you how to make up a few graphs here. Before I do that, I have to talk about the word normal. I don't mean normal like. Like is not normal. Yeah, that's not the type of normal we're talking about. I'm talking about data normal. Data normal means that data goes up to a center point and goes back down. This data right here is not normal. You're going to see that more in our graph than, than, uh, than in this data. But this data, can you see how most of the data is centered right here at the very beginning of our frequency? And then it really trails off here. Do you see that? There's no trail off up here. It starts highest and it goes lowest. You see that? This means it's not normal. Normal data would look like this. If we were to graph it on a, like a bar chart or something, it would have a rise, peak, and a fall. That's a normal distribution. This one is not going to be a normal distribution. We'll see that when, when we graph it. So when they ask you what normal means, normal means that your data rises to a peak and then falls down again. That's what normal means. Okay, so let's try making up a couple graphs. We're going to do a histogram first. If you're not familiar with the histogram, you know what a bar chart is, right? A bar chart has a horizontal and a vertical axis, and you just make little bars. A histogram is simply a bar chart where the bars are touching. There's no space between the bars, which is why we had to have the class boundaries in the first place, so we had our bars touching. So histogram... we're going to say is this is just a touching bar chart.
touching bar chart. I'm not touch, talking about touching like Hallmark touching, you know that, right? Oh, thank you for my bar chart. Not like that. It's like you know, the bars are touching. You get that? I was just kidding, by the way. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> It was funny. It was. It was funny. You got to take my word for it. Of course, we're going to have two axes, the horizontal and the vertical. It's not really an x, y because it doesn't go anywhere else. It's only the quadrant one if you were going to consider it that way. On the horizontal axis, we are going to put our classes. You use either the midpoints or the boundaries. It's your choice, by the way. You don't have, unless they specify which one you're going to use. It doesn't matter. You can use the midpoints or the class boundaries. On the vertical is going to go your frequency or your relative frequency. Okay, so let's try this. We're going to use either class midpoints or boundaries. I'll show you both cases and show you that it really doesn't make that much of a difference what you use. Uh, some people can choose to leave a little gap here. I don't. I just make it, if this were a straight line, I'd make it uh, right against this vertical axis here. So we look at our first class. What we're going to do is make up, how many classes do we have again? Eight. Our eight bars. They have to be equidistant. So for instance, if I want to make this one that far apart, I can't make the next one like that. That would just look silly. So we're going to use the same spacing all the way through. So we have our eight. We're going to have our eight bars here. Here's the difference between the class midpoints and the class boundaries. Do you guys have the midpoints still on your papers? If not, go back to them here. Can you tell me all my class midpoints? The first class midpoint. Here's how you'd use your, you know, let me show you your boundaries first and then I'll show you midpoints. Show me your, because you said the 19.5, right? Let's do the boundaries first. Uh, the first class boundary was 19.5. Here's how you would show your class boundaries. You do 19.5 here. What's the next class boundary? Wasn't it 17.5? No, the first one? Good call. Oh, you said the midpoint, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and I said midpoint first yeah. and then I asked for boundaries. See, I screwed you everyone up. My bad. 17.5. Thanks for that correction. What's the next class? Boundary. How about the next one? Wait, where are we at? Okay. And these should be on your paper. I just have to erase them. And 49.5 is the last one. Then we go back to our data, and we find out for each class how many people were there. So can you tell me how many people were between 17.5 and 21.5? As it relates to our class, that's just talking about this class right here. It's a little bit of overlap, but not much. Uh, we just need those that 0.5 to make sure that our, our gap, there's no gaps between our, our bars there. So how many people are we talking about here? How many? Okay. 
So 25 people are between these ages. This relates to our first class. So we're going to have a bar that looks like this. And we just keep on going. How much should our next class be? Drop all the way down here to 10. Looks like the next class was 4, so we're going to drop down to 4. Do that. Then we had 2. We had 1. We had 0, so we're not going to put anything there. There's, there's no bar there. But we're going to go back up to 1. Follow that, nod your head. See, see if I still have you with me here. So we're just putting this one in a picture. Same information in there. Same exact information. We are using boundaries instead of upper and lower class limits because otherwise we'd have a gap here. If we want to show that we're not missing any people, that's why we don't have any gaps. So if you're a person between these ages, you were counted. Yeah, no, no missing pieces here. Yes? Does it show the data a little bit better for the common person? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of looking at the numbers, you go, oh, wow. Most of the people are here, aren't they? You go, yeah. We have a, a strong drop-off. Strong drop-off. Do you see how it doesn't fit the normal curve? A normal curve would have, look at, look at the board, everybody. Okay, some of you aren't looking. Look up here. A normal curve would do this. You'd have little bars, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. Biggest bars in the middle. Then it would go back down to little bars. That's how normal would look. A normal curve would be this superimposed on that. This is definitely not normal. This curve goes like that. Let me get the, let me get the sound effect right. right. This one would go. That's how normal sounds. See? It's pretty. It's prettier. This is not that pretty. Just fizzles out. So that is our, that's our histogram. That's the most basic histogram. It has to do with our frequencies. Can you change it to include midpoints instead of boundaries? Yes, and it's so easy. You don't change anything. All you do is, you ready for it? Erase this. For, to me, I like the midpoints better. It looks cleaner. You put the midpoints. You're using the number that represents your, your data class the best. So here you would use, what was our first midpoint? Can you tell me? Okay. And then you'd have the 23.5, and so on and so on and so on. So you'd have 27.5. Am I getting them right so far? The next one should be 35.5. So you can use class midpoints to make up your, your Instagram as well. Either one, it really doesn't matter. What if we were to make a relative frequency? This is a basic frequency distribution, standard frequency distribution. If we were to make a relative frequency distribution, the graph wouldn't change, but this information would change from frequencies to relative frequencies. So you'd say, oh, okay, this was 58%. So maybe you'd say like, oh, This would be like 60%. And then you go down from there. You say this would be like, let's see how much is that? So 50%, 40%, 30%. Everything would look identical. That's about right, right? Everything would look exactly the same, only here you wouldn't have frequencies anymore, you would have relative frequencies. You just have percentages. Looks the same, doesn't it? Just has those percentages off to the left-hand side. Notice how the information didn't change. It's still the same information, it's just how you represent it on your graph. Still okay with me? Okay. The last thing that we can do in the last minute is you can make up a cumulative frequency distribution, and that is just this information put on that graph. So I'll change it one last time. The graph will change in this case.
just putting this information over there. So for our first class, we'll use the midpoint still. We start with how many people? Okay. So we have 25 right off the bat. Can someone out there tell me the next bar that I'm going to make? Am I going to go back down to 10 if I'm making a cumulative frequency distribution? 35. I'm now plotting these numbers over here. I'm doing these bars because we're, we're doing a cumulative frequency distribution. So we go, next up we go to 35. Next one would be what? Not much higher. Then we have. Forty-two and forty-two again, I think, right? Yeah. And forty-three. And forty-three. Oops. Why people do this one is so you can see where most of the growth is, uh, because notice how it really, really <coughs> plateaus okay. over on the side of it. It says after this part was serious growth. It was, as far as our, our ages here. And then nothing. We really didn't have that many people over here. That's, you can see that with the cumulative frequency distribution uh, as represented on history. So at this point, do you feel OK on making up all these things? You can do a frequency distribution. You can do relative frequency distribution, cumulative. You can represent on a graph. How many people are interested in everything we talked about today? Good deal. All right.